We come now this morning to the fourth of our major thematic plenary addresses for our conference this week. And as you reflect on the past several days, our vision has been raised as we've reflected beginning on Monday with God's gospel and then God's church. And then yesterday we reflected together on God's world. Today we come to consider God's strategy, a fitting culmination to those meditations. Our speakers so far in this session of the conference each day have come from, the, from Nigeria, from the United Kingdom, from Rwanda, and today our speaker is from Canada. It's my pleasure to welcome to the stage the Reverend Canon David Short. <laughs> Canon Short has for many years been the rector of St. John's Shaughnessy in Vancouver, Canada. St. John's was one of the churches which protested against false teaching in the Canadian Anglican Church and which left its diocese at great cost. Canon Short is a well-known teacher of God's Word. Let me pray for God's blessing as we hear from him. Heavenly Father, how we thank you that you open your mouth and speak to us. We pray that this morning, as we consider your strategy, you would shape our hearts to align with your heart. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your welcome. My name is David Short. I was born in East Africa. <laughs> Thank you for that applause. I did nothing. I was ordained in Australia. Thank you for that applause. I did a little more. I now work in Canada. <laughs> and I'm trying to do as much as I can. <laughs> it's my great privilege to speak today on God's strategy. And it's a privilege because God has a strategy and we don't have to invent it. God's strategy is part of his glorious sovereignty. Lord of all, from the smallest, from the smallest thing to the largest thing, God is directing all things from the beginning of time to the end of time, utterly, majestically, supremely sovereign in every detail. And as we draw to the end of Gafcon, Without thinking about God's strategy, we might go away agreeing together and feeling very good and thoroughly right and orthodox, but there would be no action. There would be no unity of action, no steps. We'd be trapped in short-term thinking. And if we're going to move forward together, we need to hear again in this session God's strategy. This is very important for us as a movement. It is amazing what God has done in this last 10 years, raising up churches, raising up leaders. We're now in the second generation of GAFCON. When GAFCON was first, uh, uh, was first our first conference here 10 years ago, it came to us in Canada at a time that was very dark. And you gave us a way forward and you said to us, we are not alone. And for those of you who are going through the troubles now, the heartbreaking kindness of God through his people in the Anglican communion is very real. But we are also facing big challenges, crushing poverty, cruel persecution, and this controlling ideology of pluralism, refugees and increasing migration, the challenge of Islam. But I think we also face internal challenges, don't we? Pride, prayerlessness, pragmatism, a prickly party spirit where it's possible to feel self-righteous about my convictions over against my other brothers and sisters and then engage in petty politics. But strategy is high level. It's what we do above the shoulders. 
And God's strategy is clear in terms of Luke 24. It is to gather the lost through the suffering and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the proclamation of repentance and faith by the Holy Spirit. In terms of Ephesian, God's strategy is to unite all things under Christ and to create a dwelling place for himself by the Spirit. And immediately I say those two things. It is very clear, isn't it, that we are part of the privilege of God's strategy. It's not just that God's strategy affects us, but that we are caught up as part of his strategy. The church is both the goal and the agent of God's strategy. And this means everything we do, we have to do in line with his strategy. And I think, frankly, that's cause for great hope because it doesn't matter how weary or how weak you feel, and I don't know what you're going back to, or how weary you feel. In the end, it's God's strategy, and he will bring it to conclusion, and we can trust him and give ourselves to it. So what I want to do is I want to take a real-life working illustration of God's strategy from the little book of Titus in the New Testament. If you have your Bible, open it up to the book of Titus. We're going to do the entire thing together. The buses will wait. This is from the Apostle Paul to his friend Titus, who is on the island of Crete. And you can think of Crete like a nation as it was then, or a diocese, or a province. And it's a great book for us to look at because the church, the, the, the culture was an absolute mess, and the church was an absolute mess. Look at what the Apostle Paul says in chapter 1, verse 12, that should appear behind me here. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And then the Apostle Paul says, this testimony is true. <laughs> this is a pirate culture, hooligans, Vikings. This is where the Philistines came from. It's, they were proud of their greed and treachery, deeply corrupt. Very tough place to do ministry. But on top of that, the churches in Crete had been infected with false teaching. But here is the amazing thing. The Apostle Paul just seems absolutely committed and convinced of the fact that God will take the toughest Cretan and turn that person into a godly, good person, someone who's devoted to good works through the gospel. Just look at how confident he is. Here is the whole book of Titus, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. And I've pulled out in purple where the Apostle Paul presents the gospel. There are three gospel presentations because the Apostle is absolutely convinced that the gospel can renew and reform and re-energize small churches, large churches, and can convert the island of Crete. And as Paul articulates God's strategy, he makes four points. Number one, God's strategy is a strategy of salvation. Salvation is part of the very name of God. So if you look on the slide, you can see three times in the book, Paul calls God, God our Savior. And three times in the book, he calls Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ our Savior. Salvation is so important, it's part of the Christian name of God now. This is the master theme of the gospel. It is a picture word of being rescued from something to something. And throughout the Bible, God would do little rescues, like rescuing his people out of slavery in Egypt to the land that he had promised. It's a small rescue because it's a picture of the great big rescue that he does in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We must not pull back from the salvation gospel. Salvation is so radical because our sin is so ruinous. Because we are saved from the rule of sin and death and the world, the flesh and the devil. We are saved from the wrath of God and from the, uh, by the overflowing free grace of God for God himself. Just look at the third presentation of the gospel in Titus 3. Have a look at verse 3. We ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, 
passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Here's my question. Do you think Paul is exaggerating? Do you think that's a little bit pessimistic? We cannot understand ourselves or the world. We cannot understand God's strategy apart from the reality of sin. In the last six weeks, I've had a lot of conversation in public places, and I've asked people what they think is wrong with the world. And all of them are very ready to share their opinions. Here is the biblical diagnosis. The apostle says we're foolish and disobedient. In the Bible, a fool is someone who says there's no God. They can be very clever, but they live as though there is no God. We make ourselves out to be God. We are in a permanent state of refusing to submit to his authority. Because at root, sin is vertical against God. I crown myself, I please myself, I make my own law. And we're led astray, brothers and sisters. We're led astray because we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We suppress the truth of God. We exchange the truth of God for a lie. And I used to think that this was the one doctrine in Christian theology that was empirically provable. But it's not. Because we are so self-excusing and blame-shifting, we need the light of the Holy Spirit. We need the new birth to see the reality of our offense before God. Hating one another. Paul's talking about racism, tribalism. And when serious disagreement spills over into hatred, this is what we are saved from. But what are we saved for? Look at the way the apostle expresses this in verses four to six. When the goodness and loving kindness of our savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, by the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our savior so that we might become heirs of the hope of Jesus Christ. Just think about this. We are not just barely saved. Salvation is more than just the forgiveness of sins. He pours his mercy on us richly. He makes us his children and his heirs forever. We don't just scrape in, as it were. Do you know the Bible says that God rejoices over us? He honors us there's this lovely verse in Zechariah the Lord your God is in your midst a mighty one who will save he will rejoice over you with gladness he will quiet you with his love he will exult over you with loud singing is that your picture of God he will sing loudly over us he is singing loudly over us now and I think what he's saying is some singing is something like this I am your God. You are my people. I have made you to live with me in all eternity in love to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and to your precious brothers and sisters. This is God's eternal strategy. It is a strategy of salvation realized in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, for Jesus Christ. Number two. Salvation comes through the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we go back to chapter 1, if you look at the first verses, uh, let me read from verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, great thing to say in a letter to Titus in Crete, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. Paul takes us up high into the strategy of God, the eternal life that God promised the Son before the ages began, and he says it's now, now the strategy comes into play, it is manifested in his word through the preaching. Manifest means to take something that's invisible and now make it visible, something that you can know and depend on. And this little word manifest has the same root. It's used three times, three other times in the letter for Jesus' first coming and his second coming. You see the verses behind me? Chapter 211. The grace of God has appeared. 
bringing salvation for all people. That's Jesus' first coming. Chapter 2, 13, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior. That's his second coming. Chapter 3, verse 4, when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appear. So it's God's strategy between Jesus' first coming and his second coming to appear and to reveal his son through the preaching of the gospel. It is as though there is such a close identification between Jesus and his gospel that eternal life becomes visible as we preach the gospel. As you preach and your uh, brothers and sisters teach the gospel, the eternal purposes of God appear before our eyes. Eternity enters into history by the power of the Holy Spirit as we preach Jesus Christ. As we preach, Jesus takes shape. People meet him in our words. It's an unbelievable privilege. And this theme of the conference, that we will proclaim Christ faithfully to the nations, it is just amazing that Jesus Christ should make himself real and appear through our preaching. This has to be our priority as GAFCON. Number three, the strategy of God, the strategy of salvation is through a rightly ordered church. Is everyone with me so far? Thank you. Don't clap. Just say yes. Is everyone awake? Is anyone asleep? Does anyone want to be? <laughs> God's strategy comes through a rightly ordered church. Just look at chapter 1, verse 5. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Here is the apostolic purpose. Here is how the strategy of salvation through the proclamation of the gospel is going to go to every diocese, every nation, even Crete. It's as every congregation has a particular type of leader because under God, everything depends on the quality of the leaders. And this little word put into order has, is based on the Greek word orthodoxy. It means taking what is crooked and making it straight. And it has two prepositional modifiers that means take it and make it straight for the sake of straightness. There is such a thing as a wrongly ordered church. So what are the kind of leaders that God, that fulfill God's strategy? Let me read these verses. They're very familiar to all of you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach, second time round. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. I think the most remarkable thing about that list is just how unremarkable it is. It's just so ordinary. These are things that are expected of every Christian. But the difference is that you must not appoint leaders where these things are not evident and plain to others. What are the kind of leaders who will push forward the strategy of God? It's not those with great talent or great gifts or who are tall and physically handsome. It's those who show plain, ordinary Christian consistency. It's not big intellect or big style or big experiences or a big voice. It's ordinary Christian character. They must be above reproach, seen by others. And notice this uh, qualification starts in the family life behind the front door, sexually faithful, managing your children with grace and gravitas and good humor, and in your attitude to others, not treating them as your servants not angry, not exploding, opening your home with hospitality. And for those of you feeling a little bit disheartened at this stage, <laughs> this is not a list of perfection, sinless perfection. There's only one who is sinless, and he is our Lord. 
but it does mean this is the direction of our lives and we ought to be making progress in these things because we demonstrate the reality of salvation in our own lives by growing deeper in repentance and faith, wider, wiser in speech and conduct. But there's only one gift that's mentioned in verse 9. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. One gift with two sides. Instruction in sound doctrine, encouraging, exhorting, preaching, teaching, and rebuking those who contradict it, or as he says later, silencing them. This is God's strategy in every city we live in. Until Christ comes again, we're not after the most gifted storytellers or those who can draw a crowd. We're finding blameless leaders who week by week teach the scriptures Rebuke those who contradict it out of a conviction that this is the truth. And one of the things we are struggling with as a communion and as a movement in GAFCON is how to bring discipline to church leaders. It's very difficult. How do we do this in a way that makes for restoration? How do we do it in a way in one place that doesn't harm gospel ministry in another? How do we do it in a way that doesn't bring gospel ministry into disrepute? And the further we move away from the local congregation, the more wisdom we need, because discipline begins in the local congregation. But clearly from what Paul is saying here in this third strategy of a rightly ordered church, what is needed is a reordering, a reforming of the Anglican communion as we seek to faithfully proclaim Christ together. And do I need to say, brothers and sisters, that if we are not following God's strategy, we must repent. That if you are a congregational leader and your life is not above reproach, you must repent and return to the Lord and ask his forgiveness. You need to stop doing what you are doing and speak to someone in authority. If you are a bishop or an archbishop or a lay leader and you are consumed by greed you are sexually unfaithful, you don't handle alcohol, you must stop what you are doing and repent and confess your sin because the greater the responsibility, the greater the scandal and the greater the damage for the reputation of Christ. What will be God's judgment on that day for wolves in shepherd's clothing? I tremble to think about it. Our structures can be a wonderful expression of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, but structures by themselves cannot guarantee gospel faithfulness to the next generation, but neither can they stop the strategy of God. The strategy of God flows through networks and gospel, gospel proclamation. So here is God's third strategy, rightly ordered churches, where leaders who have godly conviction, godly character, and godly teaching the fourth and final strategy is that this strategy of God comes through a church where people are transformed to live a new life, transformed for the salvation of others. The eternal strategy of God is worked out in the ordinary lives of believers where God takes lying, lazy, lecherous Cretans and transforms them into people who are devoted to good works. You'll see up on the slide, I've just taken four texts from the book of Titus. Those who are zealous for good works, ready for every good work, devoted to good works, devoting to good works. This is present transformation and it is fruit of the proclamation, but it's more than just proclamation. It includes doing for others what Jesus would do for them. And the scope is incredibly wide. We don't have time to look at chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Older men, older women in the congregation, you're not meant to just retire and be put out to pasture or to live for yourselves or design a bucket list and go through it. But to serve others and continue to grow in godliness and fruitfulness. Young men, young women, the Lord has a will for you to be devoted not to your, to, not to your career but to Christ and your family, to make decisions that are costly, Christian employees, 
in workforces have to have an attitude of serving and integrity. But if you look at these things more closely, if we'd have the next slide thing, please, the remarkable thing about these things is that our salvation does not just concern us or our families or even just our churches. It concerns the world around about us because in some way, God has vested his reputation in how we live in this world. Onlookers are meant to see the face of God in Jesus Christ in the way that we live. You see, three times in this little passage, Paul says, we live this way, we seek to do good so that the word of God will not be reviled or abused, or so that opponents will have nothing evil to say about us, or that so we may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. We, it's, it's more beautiful than we could believe, but we need to show how beautiful it is. And what is the power that takes people who are violent and greedy and makes them people like this? The answer comes in chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. And this is the engine for the book. For, the apostle says, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, all kinds of people in every place, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. And then he tacks on Titus, declare these things, exhort, rebuke with all authority, let no one disregard you. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all kinds of people. This is what changes the world. There is a new power at work in the world. And it's not a vague, abstract, airy thing. It's the very physical, concrete death of Jesus on the cross that happened not far from where we're sitting today. The city Jerusalem that rejected its Lord, our great God and Savior, who gave Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. And it is only the grace of God in Jesus Christ, in his death and resurrection. It's only that grace that can transform us into people who are devoted to good, who are serving others, who are a genuine blessing, making the teaching of Jesus beautiful to outsiders. See, without the grace of God, if you're not preaching the grace of God in Jesus Christ, without that, everything else is just band-aids. We're just painting over the rust. There is no de genuine deep change in us apart from Jesus Christ. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us. Because when the grace of God comes into our lives, something happens. It changes the usual order of things. The usual order of things is birth, growth, decay, death, judgment, hell. But when the grace of God comes into our lives, it's birth, growth, decay, rebirth, new life new nature, new hope, eternal life. We still decay and die physically, but we are received into the presence of God in the new heavens and the new earth when Christ Jesus our Savior appears. And with that new birth, God has installed in our hearts a trainer, a teacher, a parent. The appearance of God's grace in the past, listen, gives us a trainer in the present. For the grace of God has appeared in the past, training us now at the level of behavior, placing in our hearts new desires, new attitudes. In the past, I just wanted to get as much out of life as I could. I had no real interest in godliness or fellowship with others. But when the grace of God enters our lives, we find ourselves hungry for righteousness, poor in spirit, humble to others, and we want to please God. And this 
This word is the word for parenting. It parents us to say no to those things that don't please him and yes to those things that please him. It's a parent word, and each of us as parents, you know, we imperfectly try and raise our children, providing for them, directing them, and redirecting them, picking them up when they fall. And while God's grace comes into our lives in a moment, giving us new birth, like raising children, the training goes on for a lifetime. You do not become suddenly wise or godly, which I find very encouraging. Because after you've been a Christian for a little while, you begin to wonder if there's any real change. And the Christian life often feels like two steps forward and three steps back and one step forward and two steps forward and five steps back. And often it's hard to see the changes in ourselves and that's why we need fellowship. We need the fellowship of other Christians to see the changes in us. God's grace makes us immediately secure and slowly mature. And the way he does this is through verse 14. This is, look how personal this is. Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us to purify for himself a people for his own possession zealous for good works he died to save us he had us in his mind so that he could go to the father and say father behold my brothers and sisters see how precious they are to me and it was supremely and infinitely costly for him this is how he treasured us. This little word, his own possession, it comes from the Old Testament. It means the most precious thing to him. In his death, Jesus binds himself to us for all eternity and binds us to him as his possession so that he will be our God and we will be his people. I have a friend who became a Christian out of a very non-Christian lifestyle and he really struggled with temptation. And he decided to write on his hand each day three letters, H-I-S, his. And every time he faced temptation, he went like this, I'm his, I'm his person, I belong to Jesus Christ. The mark of the power of Jesus Christ in redeeming and purifying is the ongoing quiet seal for good works. This is what Jesus did for us. I have two sons, I cannot imagine giving up their lives for any cause whatsoever. But God's grace is so wonderful, he gave the life of his only son so that we could live in fellowship and communion with him. And that means we're not moralists, we don't live the Christian life out of fear, we don't do good works because God will get me if I don't. We're not driven by merit, we do good things to keep God on our side. Christian life is based on grace. It's based on this new identity of who we are. He has redeemed us from the power of evil and our communion is with him. And in our communion with him, God trains us to live and to wait eagerly for his coming. And that's it. That's God's strategy. It's four things. It's a strategy of salvation through the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and a rightly ordered church where people are transformed and live new lives. There is no other strategy. You might have been hoping for something very flashy, fabulous and new. It's not there. This is God's strategy. It is a strategy from all eternity past to create and save a people for himself through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, to belong to him to live in love with him, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and live in love with one another in the new creation forever. And it is more lovely than you and I could possibly imagine. He has appointed preaching, the preaching of the gospel, a unique dignity and place in this strategy of calling and saving people from every tribe and nation. And through the Holy Spirit and the preaching of gospel, God saves men and women and boys and girls, gives them new life and new hope and changes them into people who devote themselves to good works. And by his spirit, God supernaturally gathers his children into churches in every place and so orders them that they will hear the voice of Christ and they'll know him and grow and serve together and love him and love one another and reflect the face of Jesus Christ in his world, praying 
and working for the salvation of others. And when the structural authority in the church teaches a different gospel and lives a different life, do you know what God's strategy does? It just flows around those churches and keeps going. And that's why GAFCON exists. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our loving Father, we bow before you today. All the richness of what we have heard over the past days amazes us. In eternity past, you made promises. Those promises came to bear in creation and in Abraham and in Moses and in David and in the prophets and supremely in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. How lovely he is. Praise you for his life and for his death and for his resurrection. And we thank you for the gift of the Spirit who's poured out on us now, giving us new life. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that you would bring salvation through us to many, through the proclamation of Jesus Christ, that you would rightly order your churches so that we might live lives full of good works to the praise of your name. Amen.